Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction to country. Uh, I'm originally from Noongar land in Western Australia uh, myself, but it's really good to be on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, but also my respect to all of your elders and your traditions past and present as well. I was a bit nervous when Beck asked me to lead off today, partly because I'm not really much of a morning person. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh, I don't know if I'll be at my best, to be honest. She was like, no, no, you need to set the, scene, set the scene. So I have the great honour today of trying to give an overall framework for some of the things that I think are happening and that are going to bring about change over the next 50 years. We're about to hear from three extraordinary individuals and their individual stories of innovation and resilience and achievement. Um, but I'm going to pull it up to a slightly bigger, a slightly higher level to try and paint some big picture, to share some big picture thoughts with you that I think are transforming our economy. Um, and I have to say, so far this morning, it's been going better than I thought. Um, <laughs> as, I, as I came across the bridge and the sun was rising and glinting off the city and the harbour, I thought, this is all right. Um, I get it, morning people, I get it. Um, I imagine that there's a, a few of you in the room who weren't simply bullied to be here by Bex, so though maybe. Um, and, and I understand. The morning is special because it feels most limitless, right? Your day hasn't yet gone off course. Anything could happen today. You might actually do all the stuff you wanted to do today. Um, and particularly, you know, when you wake up with something to do, with something to go to, and not simply because the baby is crying or the toddler is telling me he wet the bed again. Um, it's a really special feeling. And so I'm feeling that this morning. And I think in a way that's where we're at on a much more galactic scale that the reason we live at the most limitless time in human history right now is because things are changing and everything is still up for grabs. Um, and it's when things change that we have the greatest opportunity to create something new because the existing power structures, business as usual, is crumbling and changing. And the people who recognise that first and who move in that direction, you know, and who can be part of that trend and move in that direction first, are going to reap enormous rewards. And so I want to talk to you about the three mega trends that I think are affecting our age. And I think that these trends combined are going to be as impactful to business as the internet has been. And I think much as those who recognised that first and realised that the internet was not simply some sideline, it wasn't just about having a crappy brochure site or a Facebook account, it was actually about rethinking how business could be delivered using that. And so too, I think, is the purpose economy, the first trend I want to tell you about which some people still see as a sideline, something to kind of add on and say that you did because it seems like it's worth doing. But others are seeing as a whole way to rethink business. And they're the people who are, going to, who are going to make the next billions and who are going to transform this future. And they're the companies led by those entrepreneurs who are going to be out in front. So purpose is the first trend I want to talk to you about. The second is attention and, and how we're moving from a marketing world that was dominated by interruption to one that requires consensual attention in order to work. And then thirdly, sustainability, the challenge of our age, some of the stuff that Bex touched on at the start. So let's start with purpose. Purpose to me is this big picture idea of making ethically driven financial decisions. The purpose economy is the aggregation of all the things we choose to do, all the decisions that are influenced by our values and by the future that we want to see. And it's beginning to impact an increasing proportion of our economic lives for an increasing proportion of us. And in a way, this is actually quite new. For the last couple of hundred years, this is kind of how we've seen life. You know, if you think about things on, a, on the dimension of how profitable they could be, you know, how much private benefit can be created, versus how socially useful they are, how much public or community benefit could be created, we kind of broke the world into these two segments, and they were kept completely separate. We all make, we make money however we, however we can. The job of business is profit. And then, often for spiritual reasons, traditionally, people wanted to give back in order to pave the way into the afterlife they hoped to um, experience, <laughs> which is fine. It's all about creating the future you want, right? Um, I'm a bit more focused on the here and now. But, um, but you know, we went to work. You know, we, from Monday to Saturday, we made money by hook or by crook. And then on Sunday, we said sorry for how we just made all our money. <laughs> Um, asked for forgiveness, and then we went back to work on Monday, rinse and repeat, did it again. Or uh, over the course of a lifetime, more traditional, is that we maximised wealth till we retired, and then we spent the last couple of decades of our life giving it away, right? Earning a legacy. 
And one of the interesting facets of prosperity in the Western world is it's allowing us to fill out both of the other corners. So down here, you might call that hanging out, neither profitable nor purposeful, but quite, <laughs> but quite nice, right? A little balance. That's actually quite new. People didn't hang out um, not very long ago, and in many parts of the world, they still don't have the great privilege and opportunity to hang out. But also, uh, you know, and that's an important trend, but not the one I want to talk about. I want to talk about this quadrant. Profit and purpose, the world of social enterprise, the world where you can, in fact, do the right thing, but also make a living from it and make a very, very good living if, you do, if, if everything falls the right way. And I would even say the best living. This is where I think the great fortune, the next great fortunes are going to be built is in this quadrant, and already been built, is in this quadrant. Um, and what's kind of wonderful about this and what it represents for all of us individually as well is a coming together of our whole selves. It means that we no longer need to separate the things we do at nine to five from the things we care about outside of that. That we can create a life where we actually live our values every day, every hour, and in every decision in the companies we choose to support. Um, and we are seeing this shift most pronounced with the millennials. So I'm going to talk about the millennials a bit, but I really want to contextualize that because I don't think millennials are creating this change. People talk about millennials as if they are some instrumental device who somehow just miraculously were born with a, a, a new set of values. When, of course, there's something much deeper and more complicated going on, but we see it first and most evidently with younger people who are growing up into a world that is already changed from the world that we were born in and are therefore reflecting those changes back at us first. And so you see things in the millennials that will soon be mainstream, that will soon be everyone, and you see it there first. So I just want to it used to drive me crazy. I, I ran a youth organization. I used to hate the way that these big picture generic ways people talked about young people. So at the risk of going there, I wanted to provide that caveat about what I mean. And so in some ways, the old, the old life, the old way you did things, I think, is almost best. Uh, the best example I can always think of of this is Alfred Nobel. How, who here knows how Alfred Nobel made all his money? Just a show of hands. Right, like three or something, like 3% three, 3 of the room. And what is it we associate him with now, of course? Peace, the Peace Prize. He made his money as the inventor of dynamite. Um, <laughs> he made his money from people blowing each other up more effectively. Also mining applications, but let's, let's focus on the warfare. Um, and then, of course, at a later point in life, as is traditional, he rethought things. Not at the time, but then later on, he suddenly thought, do I really want to be known as the dude who blew everyone up? Do I, is this what I want my legacy to be? And he thought, no, no, no. I'm going to endow the world's peace prize. It's got his face on it. The inventor of dynamite. His face graces the world's number one peace prize, where we acknowledge and celebrate our peacemakers. Isn't that amazing? And that's kind of how it went. You know, do what you can, and then at the end of your life, do something noble and hope that that's what you'll be remembered for. And it works well enough, as Nobel evidences. The problem with this, though, for young people is that it involves waiting, and young people are not great at waiting. Young people don't, young people don't want to wait until Sunday to live their values, let alone wait till they're 65 and retired. They want to do it right now, you know, the impatient, entitled generation, they get called. But thank goodness, because frankly, we can't wait any longer. We are entitled to a life that, we get, that, that allows us to live our values. That shouldn't be seen as an entitlement. It should be seen as something that all of us aspire to and create. And gosh darn it, the future generations are entitled to a planet that they can inhabit as well. So it's on us to begin to think about doing things differently so that that can be the case. Um, so you think about who our, you know, and so the life of Nobel in a way, you know, this traditional kind of business path got ossified into ideology sometime mid last century with the Chicago School of Economics and neoliberalism that proclaimed proudly you know, this is kind of what people were doing anyway, but they're like, no, no, but this is what you want to be doing. This is the right thing. It's, in fact, moral to not give a damn about anything except profit. The only responsibility of profit. And I'm really pleased to say that this viewpoint is now genuinely very last century. This is how millennials feel about the responsibility of business today. And you see, and by millennials, people born after 1980, which puts me a year on the wrong side. So anyone younger than me, just kind of think me down. Um, if I can pretend to kind of be on the edge there. Only 7% of them already think that the only responsibility of business is profit. And then it goes degrees of how responsible they think they should be. You know, do a little bit of philanthropy, do more. This is don't just support but advocate. And this is completely rethink how you do business. Redesign your business to create positive social outcomes. 
already 21% of young people think that the job of business is not only not purely profit, but it's in fact not profit at all, but that profit can still be an outcome from doing something that is more valuable than profit, from actually creating a world that we all want to live in. As you think about our business heroes today, and I think what's striking about so many of them is that they are purpose-driven. You may not always agree with how they're pursuing their purpose, but there's no doubt that they have a sense of purpose. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't just want to make the most money possible, he wants to connect every human being on Earth. He thinks that's a powerful social outcome. But guess what? If you get to be the person that connects everyone on Earth, you're probably going to make a lot of money along the way. Ditto if your purpose is to, is to unveil the world's information and make the world's information available. That's a social outcome, and they're very, you know, these guys are just nerds. They were just building technology um, because they were really driven by can we solve this problem? Can we make this chaotic internet, can we make things findable? But of course, when you're the one that makes things findable, you can make a lot of money along the way. Um, or Tony Say, who's the CEO of Zappos, which is not just about selling shoes, which became the world's number one shoe retailer because they weren't just about selling shoes, they're about creating happiness and, and creating delight amongst their customers. Um, or Blake McCoskey, the famous founder of Tom's Shoes, who decided to create a company where they give a pair of shoes away for every single one they sell. Um, or Elon Musk, who literally is trying to save the human race. And this is what he says is his motivation. Two of his companies, Solar Cities and Tesla Motors, are to try and help us transition to a post-carbon economy. And his third company, SpaceX, is to create a way out if we get it all wrong. Um, literally, literally, this is, what he's, this is what he's thinking about. Either, either it all goes wrong from climate change or robots. He's really worried about robots too. Um, super intelligent robots, Jordan will tell us more about it. Um, and the evidence, but it's not just these you know, superstar entrepreneurs, the evidence of a desire to live a life of purpose is everywhere. Um, you know, in who we admire, but also in the choices we make at the very earliest stage of our, of our um, careers. And you can see that all over the place. One little example I like is this organization, Escape the City, founded by 15 original members in London just a few years ago, and now 250,000 members around the world, all of them recent university graduates looking to do work that matters. Ooh, excuse me. Um, and it's already a business cost. If you think this is just all area of fairy, it's actually already hitting the bottom line in a whole variety of ways, particularly in your ability to recruit and retain the best young staff. Because the best, the best young staff, the best graduates have options. And as we're seeing, more and more of them are choosing options and will choose options that are congruous with their values. And so it is already, this is a study Deloitte brought out this started this year. It's already the number one reason university graduates don't stay with a company for more than two years is because they don't feel like that company is congruous with their values or has a, a purpose that they can admire. Followed closely by has a terrible boss and doesn't receive any mentoring and support. <laughs> but think about that. I mean, who's had a terrible boss at least once? I mean, I have. And think about how dispiriting and agonizing it is to have a terrible boss. You know, having to get up each morning. I'm sure all the bosses in the room are awesome bosses. Here you are. <laughs> Love you guys. But, uh, but, you know, how dispiriting it is to get up in the morning and go work for someone you don't admire and who doesn't feel like they're supporting you and your growth and development and how much that drives you out of that business. And then think about the fact that a lack of purpose and a lack of values alignment is driving people out of businesses even faster than that, than that agonizing experience for millennials. So this is already costing businesses that don't get it. This is already costing them, whether they realize or not, they're just like, ah, oh, recruitment costs. Um, and they don't necessarily see the connection between these things. Um, in another recent survey, over three quarters of young people said they would shop with someone who helped them support a cause, and 70% who they just saw supporting that cause on their own, and fully two thirds said it would affect who they want to go and work for. So young people are trying to align their lives. They're trying to, in their whole economic lives, who they shop from, who they work for, um, how they invest. Um, they're trying to make all of those things line up with their values, but also be profitable. You know, it's not that they want to live a life, you know, being nomads way deep in the woods or, or that they're necessarily aspiring to be Mother Teresa. They're aspiring to be Elon Musk, you know, to have that sense of purpose, but to do that in a way that does produce financial outcomes and allows them to live the life that they want as well. Um, and that's the move from purpose as a niche issue to it as a complete mainstream thing that's going to affect every business. This is my local organic supermarket. So this is what ethical shopping used to look like, right? And still does in some places. This is in Crow's Nest, tastes organic. Great little supermarket, everything in there is organic, locally made, all the good stuff. 
And this has been around for a long time. I'm not saying that like, conscious consumption is some brand new thing. These sorts of shops have existed for decades, in fact, co-ops and, and all the rest of it. But true social change is when we move from this to this, um, to mainstream supermarkets beginning to move into products, not just the shops as a, as a separate world where, where good things get purchased, but actually where they begin to take over the mainstream world, the real world of commerce. Um, so this is just a crappy photo of the egg aisle at Coles. Um, but Coles is the number one retailer of free-range eggs in Australia now. Coles no longer sells cage eggs home brand. And in a way, that's what social change looks like. Because it's not that Coles was like, oh, we feel really bad about the, the chickens. They're just like, no one buys this stuff anymore, so we're going to stop selling it. Everyone wants to buy free-range eggs. And not to put anyone on the spot, but does anyone here still buy caged eggs? I don't. Um, <laughs> Just, just checking, just trying to make someone feel comfortable. Um, no one here. No one is willing to admit it. But isn't, that, but this, but isn't this a great evidence, right? It just, it just feels wrong now. We've all got enough of a consciousness about at least that one issue that it just feels weird and wrong to save a buck by being cool with chickens living a life, you know, a, a life of torture. And so that has swept and become completely mainstream. And I think it's just the first example of what will soon happen to almost every single product line. If you're given an option of something that does bad for the world, and then something at the same level of price and convenience that does better for the world, where you don't have to go across town to the specialist shop and pay twice as much, maybe pay an extra 20%, and it's right there on the shelf next to it, people are going to choose the right thing, more and more and more of them. Um, and because we want to do the right thing, of course, it gives rise to a demand for, product, for kind of people who can help us make the right decisions. And so you get the rise of things like B Corp, which is a new certification for corporations that are benefit corporations, that are thinking about community benefit, not just private wealth. They hit 1,500 companies at the start of this year, including, I'm proud to say, Starts and Good. Um, I'd like to say we're the 15, 1,500th, but I don't know if we, there, was no, there was no door prize. Um, but you'll see a whole range of really well-known brands here who are embracing this new way of business. And the B Corp certifies that it, it looks at your whole company. It's not just about like cause marketing or philanthropy, it's how you, where you buy your power, how you treat your staff, who your suppliers are. Um, it's a full company assessment. And the only reason these companies are doing it is not just because it feels nice. I can tell you it's a, it's a giant pain in the ass to actually complete the process. It's because they think that having this mark will make them more competitive in the market. It'll help steer this growing consumer segment towards them. Um, and so business leaders, some of them are getting it. But so many of them only see bits of it. They're like hikers lost in an unfamiliar mountain range. And they can see these bits of evidence around them. They can see B Corp Mountain over there, and they can see the glacier of entitled millennials over here, <laughs> you know, and they can see the lake of the mainstreaming of social products here, but they're not really sure where any of it's going. They don't know how far the mountain range runs in any direction, and they don't know what direction to walk. So it's only when you really pull up to 10,000 feet, well, 100,000 feet, million feet, however far up space is. Um, <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Um, that you can see what's really going on. That it's not even just mountains. It's the movements from the steeps to the plateaus to the mountain ranges into the glacial valleys and then the forests and then the plains of India. And that this is formed by giant forces pushing against each other. And this is, I think, where we're at with the purpose economy, that there is giant underlying forces that are pushing purpose to the surface within our lives. And if you just think it's about the B Corp certification or about a bit of cause marketing or doing a little bit of philanthropy, you're missing this much bigger picture. And the really big picture is that it's not about business at all, of course. It's about us and the lives that we choose to live and how we choose to integrate our values and purpose into our everyday life. Business is just an outcome of that. Business is just a reflection of those values. It's been dragged along by us. So that's key. But what really makes this blow up is this second mega trend, which is the shift in marketing and communication to something that is individualized. That is about what we choose to give our attention to rather than just the art of interrupting us. Now, when I say it's moving, it's a shift. There's obviously plenty of interruption in the world. TV ads, radio ads, newspaper ads, direct mail, fundraisers who accost you on the street. All of these are models of interruption. But all of them are declining in effectiveness and increasing in cost. So increasingly, they're just for the big players, you know, who runs TV ads, just big brands. Um, and so what's great about the modern world is that it's actually shifted the balance in favor of people who have a great story to, sh to, to tell rather than just those who have the budgets to tell it. You know, we always used to say that word of mouth was the best marketing, but people didn't really mean it. Um, it was just something they said. What they really thought was the best marketing was TV. Um, 
you know, was things that could be interrupt, interrupt people at scale and convert some proportion of them. Um, because word of mouth, while awesome for an individual, doesn't scale or it wasn't perceived to scale. But of course, that's completely different now. Social media means word of mouth is not only the best on an individual basis, the way to make you pay the most attention, because I said you should, and that's much more compelling than a company telling you to do anything, but now it scales infinitely as well. So in this new world, what works is what gets shared. And what gets shared is content that is timely, memorable, and trustworthy. Because we're making a conscious choice. We know how overwhelmed our attention is. We know how overwhelmed everyone else's attention is. And so we're somewhat careful in what we endorse, in what we share, and what we forward on. It has to kind of speak to us in some way. It could amuse us. It could make us angry. It could make us, but you know, if we don't care, if it doesn't move us, it doesn't work. And social enterprises have an inherent advantage because they're inherently more trustworthy and they're inherently more memorable. And so it makes products that would never normally be memorable or shareable, shareable. Who here has ever sent out a photograph publicly of their toilet paper? Anyone who like gets home with like a great big stack and goes, yeah, Instagram that. Well, I'll tell you who does, people who buy who gives a crap toilet paper. Because who gives a crap not only has super cute packaging, but they have a story and a mission. And so in sharing the fact that I bought this toilet paper, I'm not just saying, yay, I have toilet paper. I'm saying something about who I am and what I care about. And so brands are standing in as a form of communication that represents our values as well. And so this gives people like thank you group, an unfair advantage over business as usual. I, could just, I have so many examples of this, so it won't go on forever. And it's other boring products as well. It makes boring products interesting. I mean, bottled water, shoes. Okay, people have always shared, shared shoes on social media. But still, Tom's shoes have a particular shareability, which says, I don't just care about fashion, I care about other people as well. I'm a nice person. Um, and so these companies are growing really fast with almost no marketing budget in most cases because the because their consumers are fueling their growth. They're introducing them to each other. Um, and we see this on, our, on Start Some Good as well, with the explosion of fantastic social enterprises who are rallying communities to support them to launch. So it's not just us choosing downstream who to purchase from. Now we're deciding what companies get to exist, and what companies get to launch. And so we're seeing an amazing trend of social enterprises from fashion space to technology. Look up, Gordon. Um, you'll hear more about this in a moment. Um, to, to food trucks and food businesses um, that are launching via crowdfunding, harnessing these tools to actually exist as an institution who would never have got, been able to get funding from the normal powers that be. And the other thing that this connected world does is it calls out bullshit really effectively. It's not just that it amplifies the good, it strips away the greenwashing and the lies and the distortions over the less good. You can no longer have two completely contrary marketing messages in two different countries. People are going to say, ah. We see, what, we see what you're doing. You can't rally a community to your side if you haven't built that relationship already. I think the best recent example of this, did anyone see this, was Victorian Taxis. As part of their PR campaign against Uber, they invited all Victorians to share your ta tell your taxi story. And that went about as well as you would <laughs> imagine. <laughs> because if you're not a trusted brand and if people don't believe in what you're doing, they're not going to rally to your side. They're, in fact, going to take the opportunity that social media provides them to poke, to poke you in the eye and tell you exactly what they think of you. Um, and so I think purpose is this giant storm front sweeping across the economy. But it's this second trend, this second storm front that is really amplifying. It's a bit like when one storm front catches up with another and you get perfect storm conditions. And I think we are in the perfect storm conditions right now for business that matters and purposeful business. And I think business as usual is about to feel the fury um, from the purpose economy. And then just finally, and I think I'm out of time, um, and I'm not a client scientist, but I think it is worth mentioning sustainability as the third mega trend of our age, because this is what's going to add urgency to everything else. This is going to overnight, I think, and pretty soon, double the number of people who are thinking about these broader issues. And it's, going to, and it's going to be a huge opportunity because, of course, there's nothing like a sense of urgency to motivate people to actually get something done. And, of course, it's the companies that have already been thinking about these issues, that have already been redesigning their supply chains, that have already been focusing on their long-term impacts, that are going to be poised to take advantage of when we hit a tipping point. Not just a climate tipping point, a tipping point in awareness about some of these challenges and how freaky is this GIF. Um, 
uh, about what's going on. And they're the ones that are going to be poised to grow explosively when we hit that moment. And companies that are not ready are going to get wiped out in the same way that Kodak was when digital film came along, despite the fact that they'd invented it 20 years earlier. So why does all this stuff really matter to you or to or the businesses you lead? It matters because it's happening ready or not. It's no longer about just thinking, oh, do I want to do the right thing? It doesn't matter. Maybe all you want to do is make profit. That's cool. I'm here to say that the only way to make profit in the future is to be about more than making profit. That's the big picture change that's happening. And so I actually think that social enterprise is such a, pronounced, uh, such a strong trend that it will actually soon disappear. As Clay Shirky said about technology, they become truly interesting when they become invisible, when you stop talking about it because they're so embedded and so ubiquitous that we stop even thinking about it. And so I think in about 20 years or sooner, we won't talk about social enterprise at all. We'll just, that'll just be enterprise. That'll just be business. That'll just be the ticket to play. And anyone who isn't you know, operating in accordance with the new rules of business will be seen as an anti-social business. The absence of purpose will, will poke out, not the existence of purpose. That will be expected. Because sustainability and the challenges of the next couple of decades is going to force us to think in broader terms. And so if you think about these three trends, the first one is about who we are. What do we care about and how do we integrate that into our daily life? The second one is about how we communicate with each other. So it blows the first trend up because it's not just that the things we care about are changing, but that how we talk about the things we care about has changed. And the third one is about the urgency of the present moment. And so I know what some of you might be thinking. Climate change sounds a little bit like a limit, not really limitless. Um, <laughs> and I hear you, I hear you. Um, but I think we rise to the greatest challenges under conditions of stress. You know, when we need to rise to that, we're going to hear about this from Liesl. You know, you do your best work when it, matters, when it matters most. And that's when I think anything is possible. And, and because of climate change, this stuff that is already transforming our economy anyway is going to matter more than any ever before. And I think we're all going to do our best work under, that, under those conditions. And that the leaders that can help us step through that transition and the companies that can help us step through that transition are going to be incredibly richly rewarded, both historically but also in material abundance in the present moment. And so, is your company ready? What are you doing to prepare for the purpose economy? But also, I want to put that challenge out to each of you individually, because companies are just made up of people, and they just reflect our values. And so the thing that I've been thinking about my whole career in founding multiple nonprofits and now a social enterprise um, is how do we create the future that we all want? And the answer, you know, and once I thought that was through political action or it was through information provision and different, and, you know, but we need all of that. But most importantly, I would say the way in which we create the future we want is day by day, moment by moment, in every decision we make. And so, what is the world that your decisions are bringing about? The people that you work for, the causes you take on, the volunteer work you do, and down to the things you buy and who you invest with. Um, and I think that truly we can create the future that we want, and I think that future will not only be limitless, it'll be double rainbow awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me.